happiness? Does your life seem consumed with worry and anxiety instead of peace and gratitude? The answer may be as simple as an attitude adjustment. Watch this teaching on ways to increase your happiness, and later I'll be back to answer your questions on this topic. I want to say something from the get-go, because I thought about this this morning. I felt like I put this on my heart. Our goal in life as a believer, and as believers, our goals are totally different than people in the world. How many of you know that we are called out, separated, set apart for a special purpose and a special use, and that is for God's use? We are his personal representatives in the earth, the Bible says. I love that. And so... As much as I want you to be happy, the main reason why I want you to be happy is to glorify God. And to glorify Him means to show forth all of His excellence. And I don't think sad, bedraggled, disgruntled people with a bumper sticker on their car do much for glorifying God. Matter of fact, I think... If you're not going to wear Jesus on your face, then get him off your bumper. <laughs> Amen? And so, Jesus wants us to enjoy our life. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. It's his only purpose. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it over." flows. And to be honest, really the kind of happiness that I want to introduce you to today is truly not based on what's happening in your life. Although God does want us to have good things happen to us, and he wants us to have the hope of good things happening to us. And I found it interesting, there's a, a Webster's Dictionary that's an 1828 version that if you love to study words, that would be a great investment for you to make. It's not even that expensive, but all the definitions in this version of the Webster's Dictionary are based on Scripture. And so you find a lot of Scripture throughout these definitions. And so I wish that we would have stuck with that. But as we know, gradually, little by little, the world... And Satan is the God of this world, let's not forget that, has gradually tried to remove God and anything about God out of everything concerning our society. And I don't know why it is so hard for people to see, even people who don't believe in God, I don't know why it is so hard to see that the more people try to remove God, the worse our condition becomes. But God does want us to be happy, and he wants us to glorify him. I want to make Jesus' name famous. Yeah. Amen? But if you go back to that original definition, here's what it says. Being in the enjoyment of agreeable sensations from the possession of something good. And I'll tell you the truth, if we don't have anything else, we've got the best thing in the whole world because we've got God and He is good. So we all possess good. Happiness comes in degrees. One may be happy or they may be very happy. <laughs> a person with no pain may not feel particularly happy, but a person who has had pain and the pain ceases will feel very happy now that their pain is gone. <laughs> The only person who can be really and permanently happy is the one who enjoys peace of mind and lives in the favor of God. God's favor is so amazing, and I've been thinking about just doing a whole teaching on that coming up here sometime in the next few months. Just we, we need to pray for favor and believe God for favor, because when God puts his favor on you, it's amazing the difference in the things that can happen to you in your life because you're trusting God to supernaturally open doors for you. 
But then joy and enjoy is defined as the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition of the expectation of good. So you can get happy because you have something good, but you can also get happy because you're expecting something good that you don't even have yet. And I really love that. Our privilege is to be full of hope because that's something we can do on purpose. It's not based on our circumstances. I can be full of hope any day that I want to be full of hope, and so can you. I can't always make my circumstances line up with what I would like them to be, but I can hope that good things are on their way. I can hope, which is believing that something good is going to happen. So even if you don't have the good that you'd like to have right now, at least for goodness sake, expect good to happen. Live every day with this thought, something good is gonna happen any moment. Yeah. Psalm 511 says, let those who love your name be joyful in you and be in high spirits. So we're supposed to be in a really good mood, like high spirits. Well, I just don't feel very happy. Well, your greatest privilege as a believer is you don't have to live by how you feel. You can live by what you know. In Psalm 118, 24, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, number 12 <laughs> on my list of ways to increase your happiness, just in case I don't get to it, is <laughs> decide to be happy. That's number one. Everybody listening to this, watching by TV, make a decision today, I am going to be happy. And I'm not gonna wait to have some great thing happening to me. I am deciding that I am not gonna waste one more day of my life being sad and sour. I'm gonna glorify God today and notify my face that I'm saved. <laughs> now, but leaving number 12 and going to number one. The first thing that I wanna to talk to you about today that will greatly increase your happiness is to believe what the Word of God says about you rather than how you feel or what other people say about you. My life has been dramatically, dramatically changed by learning who the Bible says I am and what the Bible says I can have and what the Bible says is gonna happen to me when I'm finished here on earth, rather than what the world told me before or what my experience with my father told me or what my, the lies of the devil told me. The Bible says that God has a good plan for our life, but the only way we can prove out what that good plan is is through the complete renewal of our minds. And the only way we renew our minds is through hearing and reading and listening to and meditating on and finally believing the Word of God. And I don't even know if you even begin to realize how much you're helping yourself today by being here. And it's not because I'm here, it's because everything that this ministry is about is bringing people the Word of God. Because God's Word is full of power that changes lives. And I am so convinced of that that I will lay my life on the line for it. There's power inherent in the Word of God. When I stand here today and say the Bible says that God has a good plan for your life, something happens. There's something about that Word of God that touches something deep on the inside of you 
And there's just a little, no matter how negative your life has been, there's a little tiny spark of hope. Can that really be for me? And when you begin to claim it as your own, and you begin to think like this, if anything good can happen to anybody, it can happen to me. Sooner or later, you got, got to get tired of being on the outside looking in and decide it's for me. There's no hope of happiness until a person knows who he is in Christ. We cannot enjoy life if we don't enjoy ourselves. Do you like yourself? Yeah, well, that was a few. You know what? I lived a large part of my life and I couldn't stand myself. And I honestly believe that that's a large part of a lot of people's problem and they never even know it. They felt so bad about themselves for so long and, and actually it's just disgusting, but sometimes Christians can actually think that's godly. I'm just nothing. A nobody and they think that's humility that's not humility that's stupidity <laughs> here's the way you think I am nothing in myself but in Christ in Christ as a child of God as a believer of the Most High you better get out of my way devil Now listen, I wore my power suit today. You know, black is supposed to be a power color. Amen. Because with all my heart, I want you to get this. Know what you're not in yourself. Almost every day I say, God, I know that I'm nothing without you. In me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. But I thank you that you're in me and through you, I can do all things. Yeah. You know, this is such a valuable teaching because we all want to be happy, but too often we let our circumstances stand in the way. Ginger joins me now with some of your questions about this subject. Well, I'm sure there were lots of questions about how can I be happy? <laughs> well, you're right. It is exactly what everybody wants. And it's, it's elusive at times. It's not always that easy, especially in the natural world with just so many things happening that seem to be coming against us. So a great question to start out with is Aggie is asking, Joyce, what is the difference between joy and happiness? Is it possible to be happy but lack joy? Well, I think probably sometimes we use the word happiness when we really should be saying joy because to be honest, happiness is probably more based on what's happening in our life, but we have an option of having the joy of the Lord. I use the word happiness because I think a lot of people understand that better in a right. practical way in their life, but I think the joy of the Lord really is our happiness, and, and when I say that, I don't necessarily just mean that the only thing we can be happy about is having a relationship with God, but I think that having hope can take any situation, no matter how difficult it is, mm -hmm and turn it into joy for us. You know, I think yeah. often about how terrible it must be for people who don't know Christ and who have no hope at all in their situations. Mm -hmm. And I know just this past weekend, I was doing a conference and I felt led in every session to start out by saying, make sure you keep your hope at a high level because hope is a positive expectation that something good is going to happen. And so we all have circumstances. We can't do anything about that. Even Jesus said in the world, there will be tribulation. But then he said, cheer up. I've overcome the world. Right. And so I do believe that it's, it's only our hope in him and the joy that he gives that can make us truly happy. Otherwise, happiness is just based on what's happening. And that's something we can't control. Right. So I hope that helps her. <laughs> it, it does. And a lot of these questions are based on 
different circumstances right. in people's lives. They're coming yeah. from social media. People are going through hard things. Right. But you're talking about something that is beyond a circumstantial happiness. Right, exactly. So, all right, then let's, let's jump in with this one. Um, Jocelyn asks, I keep trying to be happy, mm -hmm. so why don't I feel happy inside? I feel like I'm just going through the motions and pretending to be happy. And a lot of people do that. They put on right. a happy face right. when inside that's not the truth. Well, I don't know for sure that this is the case with Jocelyn, but you know, since I don't know what these questions are before you ask me, I usually try to just give out what I believe God's putting in my heart. And so I know that one of the root causes of a lack of joy or happiness for people is how they feel about themselves. And that's the first thing that came to my mind with this situation. I don't care what you have or what your circumstances are until you can be at peace with yourself, until you feel right about yourself. And even that's not based on what we do or doing everything right. It's based on knowing that we've been made right with God through Christ. And so when we come to that point of knowing God loves me, he's not mad at me, he's got a future plan for me, where you can embrace yourself, even the things about yourself that you're not particularly crazy about, trusting that God has created you. And I believe that even our weaknesses, God has a purpose for. If nothing else, having some weaknesses keeps us humble, which is extremely important. Yeah. So I just think it would be good for, hopefully, Jocelyn, but also for many people watching today to take a moment and just ask themselves, what kind of a relationship do I have with me? Am I happy with me? Mm -hmm. And once again, Ginger, I'm not happy with everything I do, but I, I can honestly say that I don't let it disturb me anymore because I know that my heart's right and I know that I'm growing. I know that I'm changing and I know that's what I wanna do. And I spent so many unhappy years in my life and I can tell you that a lot of it came down to probably a couple of things. One, not knowing how to think right, and I'm sure we'll get around to talking about that mm -hmm. before the program is over today. But the other one was, I just wasn't happy with me. And you know, if, you, if you're not happy inside, really no matter what's happening on the outside, right. you're never really going to be at peace and enjoy your life. Yeah, I, I think you probably hit the nail right <laughs> on the head. Diana asks, my hubby of one year betrayed me and I just can't let it go. It's draining my happiness daily. Um, we're staying apart at the moment, but because I keep bringing up the issue day in and day out, there's no healing for either one of us. So what do you suggest for Diana? Well, two things. First of all, um, she has to ask God to heal her heart. You can't just try to get over something like that <laughs> because honestly, there's no way that you can. Yeah. You know, there's a wound there that only God can get to. And, I think uh, that's important that she is able to address that, to say, I was wounded, you yeah. know, that, that it's okay that it hurt, yeah. but now what do I do next? Yeah, so uh, what, you know, I mean, I was abused by my dad sexually and I couldn't just get over that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I needed healing in my heart. And Isaiah yeah. 61 says that he gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But one of the things that I've realized about that scripture is that he gives me beauty for ashes, but I can't keep the ashes and have the beauty. So that's kind of where the thinking comes in. It's like, I can't just keep thinking about what he did to me. So I guess my first question to her would be, do you want to redeem the situation? Do you want to make the marriage work? And if you do, then you must let go of what happened because to keep bringing it up all the time, is never gonna work. This is gonna require some prayer, it's gonna require some time, and it may require some baby steps, you know? Mm -hmm. In other words, like, this is not something you just get over right away. I mean, unless God gives her a miracle in her heart and she's completely healed suddenly, which many times, it just takes a little bit of time and it takes sticking with things. And you know, one of the things that may be helpful is to think about, uh, our own sins sometimes when somebody hurts us. It's like, I've hurt a lot of people. I don't always do everything right. Maybe I didn't do to somebody else what they did to me, but when I do really make huge mistakes and hurt people, I really appreciate their forgiveness. Now, I know this is a very serious thing, 
to, to do something like that to someone is very serious. And I don't make light of it at all. But I do believe that they can recover, and I even believe that they can go on and have a great, great, great marriage. It's just a matter of whether or not they're willing to work through right. the stuff. So to make it short, go to God for the healing that you need. If you want the beauty, be willing to give up the ashes. Make a commitment to the Holy Spirit that anytime I'm thinking about this in a way that's not good, if you'll remind me, I'll lay it down yeah. and look to the future. And then just... Uh, Baby steps, take it a little bit at a time. You make such a good point because let's say there is not going to be marriage. Maybe he just disappears. Right. She still will have to take these steps for her own personal healing exactly. and moving forward in her own life. Yeah, because really she has to try to trust again. And that is not easy. Yeah. And yeah, she, I, I recall after being hurt by my dad and God trying to teach me how to trust Dave, and then I'd had a bad marriage before that. And I was like, how can you ask me to do that after what people have done to me? And I so remember God putting this in my heart. I'm not even really asking you to trust Dave. I'm asking you to trust me. Because there's no guarantee that nobody's ever going to get hurt again. Right. But the guarantee is that if you do, God is still there to heal you even again, if that's what yeah. you need. And he does want her to have happiness. Yes, he does. Absolutely. Leslie wants to know, with all of the horrible things that are happening in the world, how do you keep the weight of it all from burdening your spirit? Well, Psalm 37. I think about it myself a lot because I just, I'm so grieved by what's going on in the world and all the things that, it, it's just terrible. The world is in a terrible condition and it certainly would be a time to be fearful if, if you didn't know the word. But I love Psalm 37 says, fret not yourself because of the evildoer, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Now, the joy is not in that they're going to be cut down, because really, we have a space of time to pray for these people. And I believe that that's why Jesus is tarrying or taking his time about coming back, because his desire is that people would be saved, you know, that their lives would be turned right. around. And there's a lot of confusion out in the world about, about God and about well, which religion is, is right to practice. But I really think that we must put our trust in God and pray about the situations that are out there, believe in the power of prayer, because I don't like to hear people say, well, I guess there's nothing I can do but pray. Yeah. You know, prayer should be our first line of right. defense, and it's a powerful thing to do. So I read the whole of Psalm 37. It is just an awesome scripture. Fret not yourself because of the evildoers, they shall soon be cut down. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him. He will bring it to pass. Cast your burdens on Him. Yeah. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. God is still in charge, right. and we do win the war. We may not win every battle, but we do win the war. <laughs> Great news. Very important. It doesn't mean hide your head in the sand and not know no. what's happening. No. It means there's hope through That's all right. of it. Kathy wants to know, how do I keep my joy when unexpected problems pop up? Um, my ways of reacting in the old were really bad, and now I just hunger to be in peace, no matter what situation arises. Well, one of the things that I've kind of been doing lately, and I've been teaching on this some, um, is, you know, first of all, yes, we can have a very quick reaction to things, and I'm certainly not beyond that, and I'm sure you're not either. It just depends <laughs> on, you know, what it is. Yeah. Somebody runs over your toe with a grocery cart in the grocery store, and just initially you're ready to just, you know. <laughs> but thankfully, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we can feel that coming on. We really can. And so naturally, when something upsets you, your thoughts just want to get in the ditch. You know, they're just like, just like, meh, 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 meh. and so I've learned and I'm still learning to do what I call talking myself off the ledge. <laughs> in other words, you know, if I feel like I'm ready to jump off into a bad attitude or into a real bad self-pity party or something like that, I just talk to myself. Now, Joyce, you've been through this over and over. You know what the Word says. This is not the way to react. Just get somewhere and calm down. Sometimes I'll even say to myself, breathe. <laughs> yeah. Or I might even say to myself, why don't you just keep quiet? Because nothing you're saying is helping the situation. I do believe that that is a really cool answer to a problem that deep that we deal with on a regular basis. And the good news is, if she wants to do what's right, or she wouldn't have sent the question in. Right. And none of us ever know what'll pop up. No, you really don't. But a good thing is, is that 
we can do whatever we need to do through Christ, who is our strength. I love the amplified translation of Philippians 4.13. I'm ready for anything. I'm equal to anything through Christ who infuses inner strength into me. Yeah. Well, thank you for your help, your suggestions, your answers. We always appreciate it. Well, thank you. Well, today we're offering you some teaching of the Word of God, which we do on every program. I've done this for the whole 22 years I've been on TV and will continue to do so because the Word is what changed my life and it's what will change yours. It's a two CD series called Seven Ways to Increase Your Happiness. And we're sending you along some little encouragement note cards that you can write a word of encouragement on and send it to somebody else. You know, you always reap a harvest on what you give away. So encouraging other people is a way that you can receive encouragement back yourself. And today we're offering this to you in a very special way. We want you to have this today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. We just want you to do the very best that you can. Some can do more, some can't do as much. Just do something. Do the best that you can and let us send this word to you. And you know what? Your gift is going to help a lot of people continue to receive the word of God and the help that they need. And I want you to be encouraged today because you know what? God has a good plan for your life. This morning and tomorrow morning, I'm going to teach a little two-part series on ways to increase your happiness. Who would like that? All right. Now, I have 12 ways, but I'm not going to put how many ways into the title yet because I never know how far I'm going to get. So it could end up to be seven ways to increase your happiness. It could be five ways to increase your happiness. It could be all 12 ways to increase your happiness. It just depends on how I behave, and we never know that either till I get started. So <laughs> it's amazing how happy you get if you begin to believe the right stuff. Let's look at Romans 15, 13. May the God of your hope, uh-oh, there it is. May the God of your expectation that something good is going to happen fill you with all joy and peace in believing. <laughs> we'll stop right there. In believing. Most of the time when you don't know what happened to your joy or why you're in a stinky mood, something is wrong with your believing. Come on, I like these people. I'm going to preach to them. Yeah. Come on, when, you, when you're in a bad, stinky, foul mood, check your believing. What are you believing? What are you thinking? And you can change your believing. I can't help what I believe. Yes, you can. You can believe whatever you want to believe. You're making me work too hard. <laughs> See, I have decided to base my life on this. And when I started, I didn't have a lot of real proof, but I sure wasn't getting any good out of what I was doing. So if what you're doing is not working, <laughs> why not try? what a few million other people tell you works. See, you'd have to know what I was like. Man, I was awful. And I had been treated so bad. My dad sexually abused me. My mother didn't know what to do about it, so she didn't do anything. I had other relatives who sexually abused me. I married the first guy that came along, and he ran around with other women who wouldn't work. And stole stuff from me. One night I woke him, he's trying to steal my wedding ring off my finger to go sell it. I mean, I was so dysfunctional. My family was, they were the very definition of dysfunction. We invented dysfunction. I didn't know how to have a relationship. I was a manipulator. I was a controller. I was negative. I was sour. I was judgmental, jealous. How much time do we have? And I'm not, I'm not just up here, you know, like some spiritual cheerleader. I want to tell you that Jesus has set me free. He whom the 
son is set free is free indeed. That you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. It's what you believe. I've decided to believe what this says, even if I don't understand it in my brain. I do not understand how I could be the righteousness of God and holy. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. You're holy. Woo. Now, I want to tell you what. We are making the religious devils in Georgia mad right now. I mean, they are not liking this meeting. Because religion wants you to be loaded down with rules and regulations and things you have to do to be good enough for God. So you got to sign off of that plan to get on God's good plan. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He doesn't love you because you're worth being loved because the fact is you are not. But he loves you because he is good. And the more you see how good he is, the more you're going to want to behave right. Not because you have to, but because God is so good, you can't hardly stand it. When you believe, it changes what you say. You can find out real quick what you believe or what other people believe just by listening. I'm just no good. Every time I turn around me, I'm always doing something wrong. Always doing something wrong. Oh, I used to talk like that. Mm. I tell you what, you cannot get me to say something bad about myself now. I will not say something bad about myself. I will not. I don't care how dumb I act. I am not going to say something bad about myself. You know why? Because I'm going to talk about me the way the Bible talks about me. And if we believe God's word first, then guess what? Our circumstances catch up with it. You know, most of you are getting there, but there's a few, just a few of you out there that you're still like. You know why? Because you're like, well, you just don't know what I'm going through. Will you get over it? Get off of it. This is a new day. And I know, I listen, I was hurt so bad, it was unbelievable. So you can't tell me I don't know how you feel. I know how you feel. But I also know that you don't have to live by how you feel. We believe and therefore we speak. 2 Corinthians 4.13. Believe there's a good life available for you. Believe, 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 believe. I got to get off of this point and go to another one. <laughs> point number two. To enjoy. <laughs> there's not much chance of 12, is there? I've only... <laughs> hey, but we still got tomorrow morning. Live one day at a time and enjoy it. Learn to live one day at a time. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What do you think is going to happen in the world? I don't know. Nobody else does either. Everybody sits around and theorizes about what's going to happen in the world. I don't know. All I know is that sometime Jesus is coming back and I want to be ready. And I know that is a fact. That's a sovereign decree. Christ will come back. Nobody's going to do away with that one. Paul said he had learned, Philippians 4.11, I have learned to be content. And I love the amplified translation of Content, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed. <laughs> Philippians 4.11.
Paul learned how to be content in every situation. He learned it. You know what? Being unhappy about your paycheck is not going to help you make more money. Being unhappy about the debt you're in won't help you get out of debt. The only thing that's going to change anything is if you get with God, find out what you can do and do it, and then trust him to do what you cannot do. You know what? Paul was happy because he made a decision to be happy. This guy was being in prison for preaching the gospel. He was being beaten. He, people were trying to kill him. They were against him. And in the midst of all that, he decided to be happy. He decided to be happy. Say, I've decided to be happy. And I can hear it again, but I can't help how I feel. No, you can't. And I can't always help how I feel either. But thank God I don't have to live according to my feelings. I have got enough of the Holy Ghost in me to override how I feel. And you do too. Wouldn't it be pitiful if we spent our whole life just bowing down to things? Oh, yes, depression. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes, fear. Here I am. Come and rule my life. You know, when the Bible says fear not, it doesn't mean don't ever feel fear. It means when you feel fear, dig in both feet and keep going forward. You don't have to live by how you feel. You do not have to live by how you feel. You do not have to live by how you feel. We have made feelings the big boss. You need to make the announcement today to your feelings. You no longer get to vote. And so tonight, when it's time to come back to the service and your feelings say, I don't feel like going. You're going to say, too bad. I'm going, and if I'm going, you're going with me. Isn't that right? Boy, people who live by their feelings, you might as well just get a big rubber stamp destroyed and go ahead and just stamp it on everything in your life. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord, Psalm 144, 15. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. <laughs> Here's one you won't like, Luke 3, 14. Those serving as soldiers also ask him, and we, what shall we do? And he replied to them, never demand or enforce by terrifying people or accusing wrongfully and be satisfied with your rations, your supplies, and with your allowance or your wages. Well, bless God, I just don't make enough money. They just don't appreciate me around here. <laughs> you talk to God about that. God, I need a job that's going to pay me more. But man, I am thankful to have anything right now. And I'll tell you what, they may not be treating me right, but you're the God of justice and you can get back to me whatever people don't give me. You know, I, you know, I even caught myself doing this the other day. And, and I got a little correction from God. You know what? Your paycheck is not your source. I said, your paycheck is not your source. Okay, here's a good one. The government is not your source. The government can't give you anything they don't take away from somebody else. <laughs> if they want to give somebody else something, they got to raise somebody else's taxes. 
So then pretty soon those people don't need anything and they need somebody to take care of them. And I am not in any way, shape, or form talking about not properly taking care of the poor. We need to help the poor, but we don't need to enable laziness. And everybody knows that. A large majority of my life is spent helping the poor, and I will always continue to do that. But I'll tell you the truth, it never was the government's job, it was the church's job. So anyway, I better get off of that. <laughs> Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. You can be satisfied with your present circumstances because God himself has said, let's look at Hebrews 13, 5. This is shouting ground right here. Let your character and your moral disposition be free from loving money. Don't be greedy, lustful, or crave after earthly possessions. <laughs> and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have right now. For God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not. Come on, I will not, I will not, I will not. I will not leave you helpless. But if we wanna get God's help, we've gotta to look to God as the source of every good thing. I mean, if I'm looking to God as my source, or if you're looking to God as your source, he may work through your employer to give you more. But if you look to your employer, you're shutting the door for God's help in your life. Same way even with people who, maybe you're in a position right now where you need some kind of government aid. Well, fine, but don't just park there. Look to God as your source and say, God, you can do more than this. You can provide for me in a greater way. Amen? And everything that I say to you, I say for one reason only, it's because I love you and I want to help you. And to be honest, sometimes I'm willing to make people mad if it will shake them out of their complacency. <laughs> Waiting to be happy until you have your manifestation causes you to waste today. Why waste all of your days between the time you prayed and the time you get your breakthrough? Waiting is where we're tested. I prayed on Monday, but if I still don't have it by Friday, do I still believe? <laughs> Keep saying, God is working. God is working. God is working. On Tuesday, you say, God is working. On Wednesday, you say, God is working. At midnight, you say, God is working. Don't let the devil wear you out. You wear him out. There's a sadness about waste. See, I wasted enough of my days, and I don't want to waste anymore. I made myself a decision about 25 years ago, no more wasted days. I don't have another day to sit in the house and feel sorry for myself all day because Dave went out and played golf and didn't do what I wanted him to. Come on. I don't have another day to go sit in the bathroom floor and cry because Dave's watching football instead of paying attention to me. Hello. Come on. I, I, don't, I don't have another three weeks to be depressed because the person at work that I don't like got the promotion I wanted. <laughs> okay. Make a decision to enjoy your journey. Enjoy your children while they're growing up. Enjoy your home while you're paying for it. 
Enjoy yourself while God is changing you. Okay, number three way to increase your happiness is stay in peace. Oh, hallelujah. Stay in peace. You know, peace equals power. Jesus could only speak peace to the storm that everybody else was afraid of because he had peace in him. I am telling you that you can increase the power in your life. I mean, unbelievably, if you will just really commit to God to work with him to stay peaceful. Well, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that waiting to be happy until everything is just right in your life is a waste of time. God wants us to be happy no matter what situation we find ourselves in. We don't have to live by how we feel. We can decide to be happy. Today, we're offering you a two-part CD series called Seven Ways to Increase Your Happiness. To be honest, I can't imagine anybody that couldn't benefit from that. Even happy people have a challenging day once in a while. And then also we're sending along with that some encouragement note cards. I think that if you write a little word of encouragement to somebody else, then you can do that as a seed sowing and expect a harvest of more encouragement to come back to you. And we're offering this to you for your gift today to the ministry of any amount. We trust you to do your absolute best. We do this from time to time. It's a way to make sure that everybody can have the word. And so just do your best and know that your gift is going to be used to help somebody somewhere who really not only needs to find happiness, but probably Christ also. So stay with us. And when we come back, I want to take a few minutes today to pray for your needs. And that's very important. So be sure you stay with us. Discover the keys to maintaining your peace and joy in every situation. As Christians, our lives reflect God's love. And our peace and joy in Christ should make others want what we have. In Joyce's two-CD series, Seven Ways to Increase Your Happiness, you'll learn why the joy of the Lord is your strength and how to embrace happiness through Christ. You'll also receive encouragement note cards with four different designs, each one with a powerful scripture on the back, the perfect way to encourage someone you care about. These resources are available today for your gift of any amount. To order, call us toll-free at 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. God's Word is full of promises for our lives, and we believe in the power of prayer, and we pray over each request that we receive year-round. We also set aside a day each year as a celebration of prayer where we as a staff make a special commitment to pray for your needs, and we always see exciting results. This table is full of prayer requests, and these represent only a fraction of those that have come into the ministry. Ginger, you're, you're here with me today to talk about the importance of prayer a little bit. Just uh, tell me, what, what do you think of prayer? Why do you think it's important to pray? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, you know, I think anyone who has given God the opportunity to show himself has found the amazing value of right. prayer. And when we take the time to not only give our burdens to him, but to just build relationship right. with him, he amazes us. So as a ministry, right. having the privilege, I think that's why we call it the right. celebration. It's of not prayer. an obligation. Not prayer is all. not an obligation. It is such a huge blessing to us to be able to pray and bless all of the people who send in their prayer requests. That's why we love this day so much. It's important. And to be honest, I really believe that's one of the greatest gifts that we can give the people that are partners with us and the people who yeah. enjoy the program. Prayer is so amazingly powerful. I mean, I have just seen God do some just jaw-dropping things, even in the last year, just change people that have dealt with stuff for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And so praying for people is really important. And our whole staff's involved in this, right? It is. We, we like to take the opportunity throughout this day for the different departments who don't always see all of these prayer requests. We always have prayer teams who do. Right. But 
on this day, all of our departments get to pray over requests specifically, you know, one by one, each right. need. So each one is read. Yes, absolutely. We're gonna, somebody's going to read every one of these prayer requests. Yeah. And this is just a small sampling of what comes it in. Is, to be honest, so many come that in. even amazes me. Yeah. I think I'll send one in. <laughs> <laughs> we will pray for your need. Um, and what we also see is sometimes we just need something added to our faith. Right. Oftentimes, I know that God will help other people, but I'm not sure that he'll do it for me. Yeah. And if we put our requests into the hands of, of people like us who know without a doubt right. that God can do all things in our lives, it, it really makes a difference. It boosts our faith and we begin to see results. You know, I think that you hit on something really important. I know, you know we, we encourage people to pray all the time, but the Bible does say to pray for one another. Yeah. And it tells us to watch and pray, to, to watch for situations in people's lives and to pray for their needs. And so it is true that many times we need to just share something with someone. Even that scripture that says, confess your faults to one another that you may be healed and mm -hmm. restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a release in just saying, hey, I need help. You know, I've got this situation and I'm not doing well with it by myself. Will you pray for me? Yeah. So I'm excited about our whole staff being able to do this on a regular basis. And we pray all the time, but this is a special day. And so I just really want to encourage as many of you as wants to join us to send a prayer request and to let us really join you in believing God over your life. So we're going to pray for these, pray for these, but you can always send requests in and we'll be happy to have our prayer team pray for you. And you know, after someone reads this and you're prayed for, it stays in the prayer room, in the intercessory prayer room for 30 days being bathed in prayer. And I really think that is just a, a cool idea. So Ginger and I are going to join our faith together right now and we're going to just believe God for you and I know that you're trusting God also. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you, Lord, for giving us the privilege of praying for all these beautiful people. And I know they're hurting. I know people that have sent in some of these requests, they're just desperate to see you moving in their lives. And so, Lord, we want to have faith for them today. We release our faith for them today and we stand in the gap for them today and we stand with them today. And whether this is a physical healing that someone needs or a financial breakthrough or a healing in a relationship, a job they need, a personal weakness that they need to overcome to see some kind of addiction broken off of their life, nothing is too hard for you. And just the scripture that I was meditating on this morning is Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we can ever dare to hope ask or think and i believe that and so in praying that scripture over these requests i know that you will not only do what they're asking but you will even do more so i pray that they would stay full of hope and even if they don't see an answer immediately they would say i know that god is working in my life and I'm expecting great things to happen. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, we wanna hear your good reports. It's not fair to just send in the requests and then not tell us about all the good <laughs> things that happen. That is important. So make sure that you send that in and we just want you to know we love you and we believe that God is working in your life and he's doing it right now. Joyce's goal is simple to teach God's Word in practical ways so you can take the knowledge and apply it to your life. And now she has an idea to give you even more. Our goal is not just to be happy, although that's a good goal in itself, but our goal is to glorify God in everything that we do. And I, I personally believe that sad-faced Christians don't glorify God. They're not a great advertisement for salvation. So we need to uh, live our lives in such a way and even have an appearance about us that makes people want to have what we have. 
And so I think that the joy of the Lord, which is our strength and peace and patience and different things like that are very important for us as believers if we really want to be used by God. And so Psalm 511 says, let those who love your name be joyful in you and be in high spirits. So God doesn't want us just to have a, a little, little bit of him, you know, every once in a while. He wants us to be really happy and really in a good mood and notify our face so the world can tell that we've got something that they need. Amen. And you know, after having lived a long time, I've come to the conclusion that really, what do we all, really the bottom line of what, what does everybody want? You know what? They just want to be happy. I mean, when you go out and go shopping, you're doing it because you want to do something that makes you happy. You know, we eat because it makes us happy. We overeat sometimes because it makes us happy. You know, we, we want to be in relationships because they make us happy. You know, so happiness is just like something that everybody wants, but sadly, many people go about getting it all the wrong way. Now, I'm going to give you number 12 first. I did that yesterday morning. And number 12 is decide to be happy. You're never going to be happy if you don't decide you're going to be happy in spite of your circumstances. Amen? Amen. Can you decide to be happy in spite of your circumstances? Well, I never thought about it. You know, happiness or true godly joy is not supposed to be based on what is happening. Although if you look at the Webster's Dictionary definition, at least the, one of the original dictionaries written in 1828, it says that happiness is the product of having something good happen to you, but it's also the product of expecting something good to happen to you. And that's what I love, that even if something good isn't happening to me right now, there is no devil in hell can keep me from expecting something good to happen to me. The enemy might be able to mess with your circumstances, but he cannot mess with your heart and your hope. You can be full of hope and expect good things to happen if you decide to. So I'm going to say it again, maybe a lot of times today, decide to be happy. And don't wait for your circumstances to dictate to you that you can have that happiness. Decide to be happy. Everybody say, I'm going to be happy. I've decided. I will not waste another day being unhappy. I am, happy. I am happy. Now, the number one thing, yeah. <laughs> the number one thing that we talked about yesterday is that um, if you want to be happy, you've got to believe what the Word of God says about you. And uh, especially about you and who you are. And here's the bottom line. You're never going to enjoy your life if you don't enjoy yourself. So I, you know, can't go over all that information again, but let me just tell you, if you don't like yourself, then you might as well, you really need to quickly get over it and make another decision because you are stuck with you for the rest of your life. I mean, that's really not rocket science, but it really was life-changing for me when I realized that everywhere I went, there I was. So you're never going to get away from yourself, not for one second, so you might as well come to some kind of terms of peace and say... I like me with all my flaws and all my weirdness. I like me and God is changing me. Next year, I won't be exactly the way I am now, but while I'm in the process of changing, I'm not gonna be at war with myself. I like me. Can everybody say, I like me? <laughs> Number two thing that we talked about yesterday was living one day at a time and enjoying it. That's very understandable. The third thing that we talked about was staying in peace. Now, number four, big thing we want to talk about today. If you want to be happy, you got to learn to give your life away. In God's economy, what you try to cling to and keep is what you end up losing. And what you're willing to give away, you get back with interest multiplied many times over. Whatever you give to God, you get something better back. Isn't that interesting? 
whatever you give to God, you get something better back. So if you give yourself away, you say, God, here I am, you take me, you do with me what you wanna do, use me in your kingdom, use me to help people, use me to be a blessing to people, and don't just pray that one time in your life, pray that every day. Every single day I ask God, show me what I can do for you today, Lord, and show me what I can do to be a blessing to other people. Show me what I can give, show me who I can, who I can encourage. You see, I lived a long time where I was the center of my universe, and I can tell you that it will never make you happy. Selfish people are not happy people. Amen? And that's a tweet. Is that the right word? Do we tweet things like that? Yeah, that's it. We tweet that. I get them all mixed up. You, know. you can't be happy and selfish at the same time. And your life is yours to do what you want to with. You can spend your whole life just with you as the center of your universe and believing that ever, you should be the center of everybody else's universe, but you're just going to be miserable. And so you can decide today, I'm going to give my life away. I'm just going to give it to God and tell him to do what he wants to with it. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interest. Now, you know, forget yourself doesn't mean you're not gonna take care of yourself, but it just means that you're just not gonna have yourself on your mind all the time. Amen? Get up in the morning and first thing, start thinking about how you can be a blessing to somebody else, or think about God, but do something besides think about yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Now, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about carrying the cross. Well, this, you know, this problem is my cross to bear. This sickness is my cross to bear. You know, this tragedy is my cross to bear. No, that's not biblical. The cross that we carry is to forget ourselves, lose sight of ourselves and all of our own interests and say, here I am, God, a vessel empty of myself, you fill me full of you and do what you want to with me and through me today. Come on, that is shouting ground right there. Amen. Now, I might as well tell you, if you're not used to living that way, you will go through culture shock. It will be hard in the beginning because we are very accustomed to being on the throne of our life and everything, we think about ourselves first in everything. And it's difficult in the beginning because there is a dying, <laughs> a dying that takes place, but I'm gonna prove to you today that in order to really live, you have to die first. And I'm not talking about leaving the earth and going to heaven, that's the ultimate dying to live. But actually, if you ever wanna have a real life, a real quality of life, where you feel like your life really counts and it matters for something, then you have to be willing to die to self, to not get your way, and to learn to be happy about it. Yeah, well, you're not as happy as I hope you get. Some of you are thinking, well, I already don't get my way. Well, yeah, but you're not happy about it. Verse 25, for whoever, when I, like, but we're gonna go back to 24 again because I wanna make sure you get all this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anybody desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here shall lose it, eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake, we don't do this because it feels good. We're not even really doing it for other people. We're doing it for his sake. And let me clarify again that 
Forgetting yourself and losing sight of yourself and all your own interests, that doesn't mean that you never get to do anything you wanna do. It doesn't mean that you never make any good plans for yourself. Let's don't take this out of context. What it really means is, is you're not going to just live for just you and nothing else. I encourage people to take care of themselves. I encourage people to stay balanced and to do things for yourself that you enjoy doing. But that's a totally different thing than, than everything being about you. Amen? Amen? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what would a man give in exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? So I believe that we should learn to live and give. Live and give. I get up every day, everything is not about what's coming to me, everything is about God working through me. To be honest, I don't even have anything to give that's worth having if I don't first receive all of God that I can possibly receive and then let Him flow through me. Amen? Trust me, you don't want what I've got to give you. But I've done my best to let God flow through me this weekend so you can have more of him in your life. And that's what God wants us to do for every person that we meet. Now, John 12, 24 through 26 are just amazing scriptures, and I'm going to work part of this message around this. So watch this. John chapter 12, verse 24. I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you, most solemnly, I tell you, it's okay occasionally to get solemn in church. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. But I want to encourage you later to just read that scripture over and over and over. But here's my best shot at an example. This is the seed of a Georgia peach. My husband lovingly ate the peach this morning, <laughs> washed the seed and dried it with a hair dryer. He is so good. He is just so good. Now, Unless this gets buried in the ground, it'll always just be this. Not really that attractive. So unless you're willing to be buried, so to speak, <laughs> you're never going to be anything other than what you are right now. That's it. Nothing else. But if you do a little study on seed, what happens when you put this seed in the ground. First of all, it's hidden in darkness. You know, we don't like the dark times in our lives, but they do have a tendency to break the outer shell off of us and open us up to the greater things that God has already put on the inside of us. See, when you're born again, everything that God is comes into you. A seed of everything that God is comes into you, and if you'll allow me to put it this way, you become pregnant with godliness. Amen? Pregnant with Christ-likeness and godliness. When a man and a woman who are married come together in love and purity, and his seed is planted in her womb, she becomes pregnant Come on. And as that seed is nurtured and taken care of, then eventually she gives birth. But let me just remind you that birthing also comes with pain. Amen? Just saying. Okay? And if this seed had feelings, we're going to pretend for a moment that it has feelings. It's probably kind of just enjoying being a seed. 
And all of a sudden, somebody will say, God comes along and puts it in the dirt, in the ground, in the dark. It's suffocating in there. It's hot in there. There's pressure from the ground. But the heat from the ground and the pressure from being buried eventually breaks off this outer hull. Come on now, you're going to have to go with me spiritually. Amen? So, here I am, Susie Christian. I've got all this great stuff in me, but unless God gets to do this work in me, it's just going to stay buried in me, and nobody's ever going to really see Christ through me because I go to church and go home, go to church and go home, go to church and go home, and nothing ever changes in my life. So, as it stays in the ground, what happens is this breaks open and then all these little rootlets begin to go down and take hold in the ground. See, sometimes we don't understand why a bunch of great stuff is not happening to us if we're children of God. Well, you're going to have to take some time to just get rooted and grounded. Amen. Rooted and grounded in the love of God. Rooted and grounded in Christ. Rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And then eventually, as this seed is watered, I think it's so cool that God talks about being watered with the Word. Amen. As this seed is watered and it's nurtured and cared for, then after a while... <laughs> Nobody knows the exact time, but after a while, and after a while, this thing that was just this very unattractive, hard, useless seed becomes an amazing Georgia peach tree. And now this fruit can be picked and sent all over the world. Come on, is anybody listening to me today? And sent all over the world for other people's nourishment and enjoyment. Come on, give God a big praise. And, you know, just to take a moment and just speak lovingly to our TV audience, you know, um, these folks that are here, they've got, a, I, I know, some level of commitment or they wouldn't be out here on a Saturday morning. And I don't know how much you know about the things of God or the Word of God or how much you even fully understand what I'm saying right now, but I just want to clarify again, if, if your life is just all about you, and that's all you think about or care about is getting what you want and having everybody else uh, serve you to give you what you want, you are never going to be happy. And listen, you could even get what you think you want, and then you're going to find out that even that didn't make you happy. Because it is impossible to be happy if you're not willing to give yourself away. Amen? And I don't even know really how many Christians pray these kinds of prayers on a regular basis, but I tell you, we are just pitiful indeed if all we do every morning is present God the 12 things He has to do right away in order for us to even stay saved. Well, God, if you don't do this, I just can't be happy. And if you don't do this, I just don't know if I can go on. And if, if I have to put up with this one more day, God, I just don't think I can hang in there anymore. <laughs> yeah, we all have things we want. Every one of us have things that we want. I have things that I want. But you know what I've learned? If you seek the kingdom, God will add the things. Amen. And... 
Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. All right, now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. And boy, I like this. Mm, I like this. See, some of you, you're just starting to feel a little bit freer already just with the very thoughts of, I can just kind of feel that in the spirit today. It's just kind of like, wow. Come on, why don't some of you just retire from self-care? Let's throw a big retirement party. When somebody says, why are you so happy? Say, I'm not concerned about myself anymore. I've given myself away and whatever God does with me is up to him. If he gives me what I want, that's good. And if he doesn't, that's probably even better. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse five. Now they're actually talking about a financial offering here, but I love what this says. Nor was this gift of theirs merely the contribution that we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us as his agents by the will of God, entirely disregarding their personal interests. They gave as much as they possibly could, having put themselves at our disposal to be directed by the will of God. They gave themselves to the Lord. Paul said, not only did they give an offering, not only did they put some money in the basket, but they totally submitted themselves. And so even when you give your offerings in church from now on, before you drop it in, why don't you say to the Lord, I'm giving you this little token, little tiny bit of what you've given me, but Lord, before I put it in here, I just wanna re-clarify that I'm giving you myself. How about if we put ourselves in the offering basket? Come on, I like that. Woo. Well, perhaps three of the greatest keys to happiness are gratitude, hope, and just learning to stay positive in every situation. You know, these things can go a long way in creating a happy life. They were a revelation to me personally, and they really helped to transform my attitude. I know that you really want to be happy. Who doesn't want to be happy? We all want to be happy. And today we're offering you two CD series, that's two hours of teaching on CD, seven ways to increase your happiness. I can't imagine that you might not need at least one or maybe two of them. And also we're gonna send you along a gift of just some encouragement note cards that our ministries put together things that you can write a little encouraging note on and send it to someone else. And you know, I believe when we encourage others that it actually increases our joy. And guess what? We're sending that we're offering this to you today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. We do this occasionally and we like to do it because we know that some people don't have a lot and we want them to be able to have access to the teaching. And what I always trust is that those who have more can maybe give a little extra today just to help those who don't have as much. You know what? I believe that you can be happy every day in your life through Christ, but only through Him. And you know what? The Word of God helps you do that. It helps you stay stable. So make an investment in God's Word and let it enrich your life and cause you to be even a happier Christian than what you are. God bless you. The next point that I want to talk about, which would be number five, is don't let other people run your life if you want to be happy. Yeah, I knew I was going to get some action on that one. You know, until we learn how to succeed at being ourselves, which means to follow your heart, not your flesh, your heart, which means to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Come on. The leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're never going to be really, truly happy. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said, Now, am I trying to win the favor of men or of God? 
Do I seek to please men? If I were still seeking popularity with men, I would not be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I would, have, I would have lost this whole opportunity to be an apostle of Christ. And I can tell you right now, if I would have been trying to keep people happy, I sure wouldn't be standing here today in this ministry. It's amazing what we cheat ourselves out of, but what we also cheat everybody else out of. Because God has not only got something for you that will fulfill you, but he wants to use you to bring something to somebody else. And I probably would not be wrong if I said that the largest majority of people miss the fullness of their destiny. Because the one thing you can be guaranteed of that the enemy will bring against you is a threat of rejection if you dare to fully follow God. Let's look at Daniel chapter 3. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, and the lyre, all those other instruments, bagpipes, and every kind of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast at once into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who can save you? Now, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were called into the king's service, not where they would have wanted to have been, but they were brought into his service. And in the midst of it, they were still determined to behave themselves as godly men. Now, to me, this is a great example of where we're at today, and I'm sure where other people have been at in every generation. Let me tell you something, that there is persecution for Christians. <laughs> now, if you're a sneaky Christian, a secret, hidden, Sunday morning Christian, then you might avoid the persecution. But if you're, if you're a full-on going to live for God, believer, then you're going to have some persecution in the world. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given this message. Now here's an image of the king, and everybody's going to bow to this image. Well, they knew they couldn't do that because they weren't going to bow to anybody but God. And so here came the threat, which we always get the threats. If you don't bow down, there's going to be suffering for you. In this instance, that we're going to be put into the fiery furnace, for us sometimes is that you'll be put out of the group, we're no longer going to like you, we're going to gossip about you, you know, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. How many of you know what that means? All right. Number 16, Shadrach, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, it is not necessary for us to answer you on this point. In other words, that's so stupid, I'm not even going to answer it. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, he will deliver us out of your hand, O God. And it didn't mean like if he's able, if he's capable of it, but what that really means is if that's the best thing, if that's what God wants to do, he will deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So in other words, you do what you want to, but we've decided to follow Jesus. You do what you want to, but I've got my mind made up. Boy, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and his facial expression was changed to antagonism. <laughs> you ever had anybody give you a dirty look? against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he commanded that the furnace should be heated up seven times hotter than normal. I love it. Boy, you stand your ground, you make a right decision, and the problems multiply. 
And he commanded the strongest men in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego and to cast them into the furnace. Now I want you to watch carefully. And these three men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, or their undergarments, their turbans, and their other clothing, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames and the sparks from the fire killed those men who handled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound. Everybody say bound. bound. Boy, this is so good. I don't know if I can preach it. <laughs> they fell down, bound, into the burning, fiery furnace. Boy, they looked like they were in bad shape. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king saw and was astounded, and he jumped up and said to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? <laughs> and they answered, true, O king. Verse 25, and he answered, behold, I see four men. Now here it comes. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, you're too early. I see four men loose. of them went in bound, the fourth man got in there with them, and he actually used what the king meant to destroy them to cut the bondages off of their life. Oh, man. Walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the furnace, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. <laughs> oh, what a message. There must be something different about you guys. You better come over here and tell us what it is. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire, and then the satraps, the deputies, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw these men, that the fire had no power upon their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed, neither were their garments scorched, nor did they even have the smell of smoke. Now, number six, <laughs> thank you. If we're ever going to have any happiness, we've really got to understand the grace of God. And just to make it as simple as I can for the amount of time I have, Grace is not only God's undeserved favor, so that means instead of me spending my life trying to kick down doors that I want to go through, I can trust God to give me favor and open the right doors for me at the right time. Grace is what changes us, God's power. Grace is not only undeserved favor, it's God's power coming to us free of charge, to enable us to do with ease what we could never do on our own with any amount of struggle and effort. That's my very own definition. You want it again? Yeah. Grace is God's power coming to us freely. All we need to do is receive it. And it enables us Grace is enabling power. It enables us to do with ease what we could never do on our own apart from God with any amount of struggle and effort. 
I tell you, I tried so many years to change myself because I knew that, you know, I had problems. I tried to be happier. I tried to be peaceful. I tried to be a better person. I, you know, I tried and tried and tried and tried. And instead of it working, I actually was getting worse. Because the more frustrated we are, the worse we behave. And God began to teach me out of his word that it was only his grace that could change me. To make, it, to make a long story short, we're saved by grace. We get that. It's like, well, here I am. God. I, you know, I've done everything. If you don't help me, I'm done for. And we receive. We don't get salvation. I don't like the terminology, how many got saved. <laughs> We've had about 1,200 people receive Christ in this conference. You cannot get a free gift. <laughs> you receive free gifts. By grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the same way that we're saved is the same way we have to learn how to live. Now, grace is about a 20-part teaching series. And I've got about three minutes here for this section. So let me just tell you that any time that you feel frustrated... <laughs> it's because you're trying to do something that only God can do. Anytime you're frustrated, you're trying to do something that only God can do, and you need to stop and just say, okay, I've gotten over into works of the flesh, which is my energy trying to do God's job. I'm going to back off here, God. Help me. I need you to make this happen. Apart from you, I can do nothing. And then realizing that God doesn't do everything in our timing, nor the way that we would do it. So after praying, we then trust God and we watch him work. I finally stopped trying to change myself and lo and behold, I've been changed. You say, now wait, 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 wait. What do you mean you don't try to change yourself? <laughs> wow, well, you just can't not try to change yourself. Well, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. I pray every morning, Lord, set a watch over my mouth lest I sin against you with my tongue. Help me, Lord, not to get in trouble with my mouth today. And if you don't help me, I'm definitely going to get in trouble. Now, hang on. And here's how it works. I pray and then the Holy Spirit reminds me. I'm going through the day. I'm busy going along. See, this is how the Holy Spirit's just with us all the time and he works in our life. And I start, Dave says something and I didn't care for it. And I say something back and then he says something back. And then I get this little like, I mean, okay, see, you get it, you know. Now, you know, maybe you're not quite where we're at, and you're like, what's she talking about? You get this. Well, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and the Bible says in Romans 7, 6, that we no longer live by the law. We don't live by all these rules and regulations of how we have to behave for God to love us, but we now live by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So the truth is, if I make a hundred mistakes with my mouth today, God's still going to love me. I'm still going to go to heaven, but I want to do what's right because I love him. So instead of me going around saying, well, I, I, I'm just not going to say anything today. That way I won't get in trouble. Because <laughs> see, all we know how to do is be extreme. I'm just not going to talk at all. And that way I won't get in trouble. And that doesn't work. We all know that. We might shut up for a while, but boy, when we open our mouth. <laughs> woo. 
But here's what you do. Instead of saying, boy, I can't do this today, and I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I better not do this. You just get up and say, God, I want to be all you want me to be. Holy Spirit, I ask you to remind me if I'm about to get myself in trouble. Then my part is, and we have a part, you have a part, but it's not like this fleshly effort. It's just a, it's a spiritual effort, but it's just a saying, I want to cooperate with God. Okay, Lord, you're telling me to zip my lip, and if I don't, I'm about to start a fight with Dave, then I can just shut up. You didn't get that? Was that hard? How many of you are understanding what I'm saying? Now, two quick things that were on my heart. First of all, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 15, 10. The Apostle Paul said, but by the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God, I am what I am. <laughs> and his grace toward me was not found to be for nothing, fruitless and without effect. In fact, I worked harder than everybody, but it was not really me. It was the grace of God in me, which did the work. Now, I mean, this could initially even sound a little confusing, but Paul is saying, look, I am what I am by the grace of God. But when God offered me his grace, I didn't take it in vain. I took that power of the Holy Spirit and I used that to do the things that God wanted me to be, do. Now, Paul's, okay, now here I am, I'm a successful apostle, but let me remind you that it's only because of the grace of God. And I can tell you today, I mean, honestly, when I come up here and I preach, and I've done this now for 40 years, but when I come up here and preach, I'm just like, it's almost like I'm somebody else. And, well, that probably doesn't make any sense, but it's like, I'm like, <laughs> Because you see, when the, when the grace and the power and the anointing of God comes on you, the Bible says it turns you into another man or woman. We can do things by the grace of God that we cannot do any other way. But let me also tell you, when I come up here, I am not depending on me. Now, I've studied, I've worked. But even that, I need God's grace to keep doing. I've been doing this 40 years. This may be your first conference. It's not my first rodeo. <laughs> Amen? And just to want to keep doing it, just to stay fresh, just to have yet another message, just to stay in one more hotel, I need grace, grace, and more grace. So you got to depend on God all the way through. You could stop grumbling about your jobs if you would depend on God's grace every day when you go there. Ooh, I wish I had another day. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, I'm not going to take the time to go there, but let me tell you something. If you are in a difficult situation, you have a difficult child to raise, you are in a difficult relationship, you're in a relationship with somebody that is really hard to be in a relationship with, <laughs> anybody, you're in a position where you're needing to take care of elderly parents, and no matter what you do, they don't like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I want you to listen to me. Any place where God has put you, He will give you the grace Wait, 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 wait. To be there and be happy while you're there. Amen. 
Paul prayed that God would deal with what the Bible calls the thorn in his flesh. Three times he called on the Lord, and the Lord said, I'm not going to remove it. My grace is sufficient. And the Amplified Bible says, my grace is sufficient to enable you to bear the trouble manfully. In other words, my grace can enable you to be in that situation and put a smile on your face and serve me and do it with a good attitude. But you're not going to get grace if you get up. Oh, I got to go to that stupid job again and driving this stupid traffic and I don't make enough money and I hate this job and I hate the people and you forget getting grace if that's going to, but you get up and you say, God, this is where you've got me right now and I'm going to trust you that when you're done with me here, you're going to put me somewhere else. But in the meantime, I'm going to go there by your grace with a smile on my face and I am going to represent you and I am going to glorify you. Amen? That's what grace is. Grace doesn't just hang around to forgive my stupidity. It does that too. But grace enables me. And then I got to take just one more point here. Number seven, if you're going to be happy, there's four things you got to understand about people. <laughs> Number one, we need them. We just can't make it through without them. And God did it. He fixed us to where none of us have got it all. <laughs> They're not easy to get along with. That's the second thing you got to remember. Number three, most of the people that we deal with are not like us. And we're looking at them going, what is your problem? How could you like that? Why would you do that? And in dealing with people, we must not be touchy and easily offended. <laughs> but we must be extremely generous with forgiveness. Amen? Well, I know now you're wanting the rest of the points, right? Uh, I'm just going to read them to you really quick, really quick. Learn the power of prayer. Instead of trying to make things happen yourself, pray about them. Be positive and full of hope. Be thankful. Be obedient. And decide to be happy. Amen. Well, perhaps three of the greatest keys to happiness are gratitude, hope, and just learning to stay positive in every situation. You know, these things can go a long way in creating a happy life. They were a revelation to me personally, and they really helped to transform my attitude. I know that you really want to be happy. Who doesn't want to be happy? We all want to be happy. And today we're offering you two CD series. That's two hours of teaching on CD. Seven ways to increase your happiness. I can't imagine that you might not need at least one or maybe two of them. And also, we're going to send you along a gift of just some encouragement note cards that our ministries put together, things that you can write a little encouraging note on and send it to someone else. And, you know, I believe when we encourage others that it actually increases our joy. And guess what? We're sending that we're offering this to you today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. We do this occasionally, and we like to do it because we know that some people don't have a lot, and we want them to be able to have access to the teaching. And what I always trust is that those who have more can maybe give a little extra today just to help those who don't have as much. You know what? I believe that you can be happy every day in your life through Christ, but only through Him. 
And you know what? The Word of God helps you do that. It helps you stay stable. So make an investment in God's Word and let it enrich your life and cause you to be... Easy.